You're now listening to the Live Different Podcast with Matt Wilson. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Live Different Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Wilson, and today I'm here with a very special guest, Jody Ettenberg. Jody came my way uh, by way of Chris Gilvu, the author, and any friend of Chris is a friend of ours here on the Live Different Podcast. Uh, she has she is now celebrating 10 years at her website, LegalNomads.com. Uh, she has some really interesting perspectives from going from corporate attorney to traveling the world, building a business that she loves dearly, and now is taking a little bit of a hiatus, and we can talk more about that. But uh, Jody, I'm, I'm uh, honored to have you come on today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. You're, you're very welcome. And uh, yeah, w- would you mind telling us a little bit more about how you went from from corporate attorney, which uh, I'd love to know how much fun you were having <laughs> and how you how you got into that, made the decision to be an attorney in the first place to, geez, what you've done for the past 10 years. I think it's a, it's a good place to start because I think people, you know, hear the story outline and assume I always wanted to be a lawyer and then I burnt out and quit when the reality is that I really had no desire to be an attorney and someone bet me that I couldn't get in at, at 18. Uh, so I basically skipped the undergrad degree and went straight to law school and, and most of the of my colleagues were quite a bit older. Um, it was truly just me being stubborn. Uh, that was the only reason I applied. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm from Canada, so I went to McGill Law School and tuition is very, very reasonable, especially since I was a resident of the province of Quebec. So in, in that sense, it wasn't this huge undertaking from a debt perspective that I know many American listeners will have to struggle with for that kind of decision. Uh, I could be a little more hubristic about it, I guess. And I went to law school. I, I was recruited to a firm in um, in New York City. They didn't understand why I was so young. I think they, they're like, was there a mistake on the date of birth when you filled out that form for us? Um, and I ended up working there for about five years, total five and a half. And I had always really wanted to go to Siberia, actually. That was the genesis of this whole travel for me. I, I had traveled in the past um, alone every so often. The first trip I ever took alone was I was, I took a, a one-year degree in France and I forced myself that first weekend to go to the train station and, you know, just where I said, wherever the next train is, the furthest away place I'd like to go. And, and this, this French woman was just like so appalled. She was just like, what is wrong with you? I was like, just, just, can I buy the ticket? You know, <laughs> and, and I had an amazing weekend and I often joke, you know, what if that weekend was terrible? Maybe I wouldn't have been this, this world traveler, but it wasn't, it was great. And so in my time in New York, I was basically you know, I enjoyed my life. I did go out with friends. I took vacations, but I was mostly saving to take a trip to Siberia. That was the goal. Um, and over the time, um, I basically decided it would be a one-year trip around the world instead of simply Siberia and the Trans-Siberian trains would be part of that journey. Wow. And I'm sure everybody is wondering, just like I am, why Sibir- Siberia? <laughs> That's fair. It's a fair question. Um, your the the reference. Chris Gillibo, um asked me that question. Actually, I spoke at his first World Domination Summit, and he was like, "Really, Siberia?" Um, I saw a documentary about the Trans Siberian trains when I was younger, and I was just my curiosity was piqued. I, it's this this sort of crazy undertaking of building trains tracks in in these completely outlandishly, you know, isolated areas and connecting little villages along the way. And, you know, so many people d- died building it. It's such a, a remote place. There was an amazing National Geographic story a few years ago about the one doctor who kind of hopped on the trains and got off at each village to help people along the way. You know, that was his job, but just how remote it is and just was so fascinating. I really wanted to go. Um, Lake Baikal has the world's only freshwater seal. That seemed pretty interesting. And I just... <laughs> decided yeah the same way I decided to go to law school my parents would say that uh going to law school may not have been what I wanted but they weren't too shocked that I didn't do a terrible job at it <laughs> right that that wow that's uh that's really interesting and 
We have a trip leader, actually, uh, Jono, if we have a lot of under 30 experiences alumni who listen into the podcast. So uh, shout out to, to Jono, one of our trip leaders. But he keeps asking, when are we going to do a trip to Inner Mongolia? And Yes, uh, so I, fascinating. Yeah, it is. Forgive my ignorance, but that space is, is that the same place? Siberian, Inner Mongolia? I mean, at least no. they have to be close. No. They are, they're not, I mean, close is relative when things are so, the landscapes you're talking about are so enormous. And, right. and, fr- and frankly, that's part of what made it so incredible. You know, I chose to go, um, I chose to take the Trans-Siberian to the Trans-Mongolian line. Instead of going up to Vladivostok in the north, I went, um, I went to Mongolia and then crossed into China to Erlian. Um, and it was, you know, insane in, in a million different ways. Um, Inner Mongolia is actually like an autonomous region inside China, um, so it's it's not part of um, the Russian the Russian area. It's not part of Siberia, and it's not part of Mongolia either. But I, I went to Mongolia itself and um, ended up staying with a family of nomads in the middle of the Gobi. And I remember just getting up in the middle of the night and looking outside, and they you know the outhouse was quite far it was basically a box put over a hole um you need to move the box to go to the washroom and i couldn't go because there was like too many sheep and goats between me and the box and i was just like i quit my job at that point it was in september and i quit my job and left on april 1st 2008 which is why the 10 year anniversary is coming up and it was like one of those of many extremely surreal moments i still had a blackberry with me at the time and i remember taking a photo and of all these eyes staring at me um, and sent it to my parents, and I was like, "This is a little extreme, even for me. Just <laughs> the amount, the amount of change between you know getting up every day, going to my corporate job, and working hard, and then um, being in this completely new place where like you can't walk between the two poles inside the the yurt because it's it's not what people do. It's it's considered bad, superstitiously bad luck." Um, and so many rules like that were more animist based. It was just an amazing, fascinating experience. And, you know, I looked forward to that portion of traveling for for like a decade, you know, and and it really was as incredible and otherworldly as I as I would have wanted. Geez, that, OK, that sounds like that. And I have to go back to the nomads in the Gobi. These are literally <laughs> nomadic People, it's yes. like something that you hear about in uh, in Sapiens, the the hot new book out. Uh, but it, could you explain a little bit more about the nomadic people? Sure, it was a family um, that was from um, from that region. I, I actually had asked. I was trying to understand because they are nomadic, right? They they pack up the the yurt and they move it within seasons, and and there's like a a system and it's amazing to watch them unfurl them and, and set them up. I actually wrote a piece about the history of yurts um, last year or two years ago, because I was interested as well in, in just how they came to be so structurally fascinating um, and they're decorated beautifully. And th- they said that they could move within the province of their birth. Um, that's what they told me when I was there because I asked, you know, do you have to ask permission or, and they said that you're allowed free reign to move within where you were born um, in that region throughout the seasons. And they had camels and horses um, and a little satellite dish on top of the yurt to get, um, to get TV attached. But they were, they were a family. And the first night I was there, um, the head of the household, it was this gentleman, um, it was his birthday. And so they had, you know, fermented mare's milk, which, which is really terrible. And, um, (laughs) but you know, can't, refuse it because it would be really um inhospitable (laughs) to do so just very rude um and they we all sat on the floor of the kitchen yurt and and ate with our hands and it was just it was it was pretty crazy and i think those are probably of all the 10 years of traveling you know people talk about the authenticity of experiences and you know there's a lot to be said about how technology has changed that, how tourism has changed that, and and a lot of it is not fixable. Uh, nor should we be, you know, obsessively seeking out experiences like that. But I found over the years, the times where someone's just invited me to something are the times you put down your phone, you don't do anything but sit there and soak in just how amazing it is to be witness to these 
to these cultural things that you just wouldn't have access to at home. And from weddings to funerals to whatever it was over the years, I think the that dot to connect them all uh, started for me in Mongolia like that. Wow, that's that's really incredible. And uh, not to go down too much of a rabbit hole, but kind of what? Why? Why <laughs> are the people nomadic? I, I'm fascinated. Why the, that is? I mean, they've been nomadic for generations. Um, there are people in Ulaanbaatar in the city and they have gone to live there um, as well. But it's, they were, I mean, if you look back at the history, you know, they, they, there are different tribes within the region. The borders that we know now um, are different. So what was bordering, um, you know, Siberian nomads have a different crop of, of, of livestock they raise um, Mongolians tend to be the land of horses and the percentage of the population is there's still like there was still a percentage of former nomads who lived kind of in a shanty town within um, within Ulaanbaatar itself like try, trying to go in to seek work but there were I think when I was there they were t- saying it was you know up to 40 percent still lived as nomadic herders it's really central to their identity um, and to their culture um, it, and it's obviously very different to how we how we grew up. Sure, sure. It's, it's um, the the culture of Mongolia itself has been so heavily impacted by the nomadic way of life. Um, and you know, in the twentieth twenty first centuries, Russia has played a big influence, um, and the history of the country has changed a lot as well. But you know, from the beginning, the old literature or or oral literature or songs, you know, horses. And nomadic life is really um, is really central to to the country. No, that that's that's fascinating, and uh, yeah, that's helpful to know that they are are herders with domesticated animals. It's not, or maybe they're they're are they hunters as well, or they're not chasing any type of animal. No, it's more that they'll have their livestock, and you know, we I had I was I had to help the first night, second night, kill. Oh, we had to we killed a sheep the first night because. Um, it was his birthday. And so like they, they like killed one of their sheep and, um, it was like my job to chase off the magpies who were trying to run off with the intestines. And when, you know, I've, I have been, I was vegetarian for a few years of my life. I'm celiac. So I put meat back in my diet when I was diagnosed with that because I was like, well, I'm really cutting things out at this point. <laughs> um, but you know, being, when people tell me, well, you, you eat meat, but you don't understand if you had to kill an animal or if you had to be involved in that, you wouldn't. And I was like, no. You know, I've been involved in it and they ate every single part of it and they used every single part of it for clothing, for, you know, the, the stomach bladder to hold things when they fermented the mare's milk. Like there's just, they're using every single part of that, of that animal. Um, they're, in terms of um, religion, you know, they do have Tibetan style Buddhist temples as well in Mongolia, um, but the, the animist component, because sort of shamanism or, or animist beliefs come so closely to the nomadic people. It's really interesting to learn about how they interact as well. And, and the superstitions, I, I wrote a whole post about the things I learned, you know, and, and the ways that people interacted, again, so so different to how we, we grew up. And that's part of what makes travel so fascinating. If you can just sit back and watch it, and learn, you know, you come away with a lot more flexibility in your own mindset, right? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, you do. And, and you also said something there that I wanted to dig in to about these types of authentic experiences where uh, people have the idea that when they travel, they want to go back in time or they want to right. see things that are just so foreign from them and then often they go places and they see the effects of globalization and it looks a little bit too much like home and then they're kind of disappointed and uh, so I'm, I'm curious your take and, because you said specifically that the point of travel or or not to put words in your mouth but basically I think <laughs> what you were saying was the point of travel is not to seek or that we shouldn't seek out these type of experiences as the end goal could you mind elaborating uh where you were going with that sure i mean that you can get into obviously a really long discussion about the more like meta philosophy of it and i think it's something that that there'll always be on the table to discuss there's 
there's no right or wrong answer there. I think for a lot of people, this kind of like obsession with finding authentic spaces comes down eventually to the, this kind of searching for themselves and it becomes almost a narcissistic pursuit. Um, that's certainly not everyone at all, but I think, you know, when people obsess over finding the off the beaten path places when they only want to go places, other tourists don't go. And there's this kind of supercilious component to it where, you know, they're better than non normal travelers they're better because they're doing something different or they've they fought harder to get to this place sure you know as with anything in life your mileage may vary and and your experiences are valid regardless you know i certainly don't have much patience for a kind of tourist or traveler who doesn't actually want to learn about where they're going and that to me is like a bare minimum you if you go to just take a photo and leave again with with no background then that's a, that's a real wasted opportunity, you know. But I think the kind of obsessive hunting for unicorns traveler is doing a disservice to themselves as well because it creates this kind of bias as well um, and clouds their their value system about what travel is. And I I had written a piece um, a few years ago, actually maybe 2011 or 12 called "What What Does Off the Beaten Path Really Mean?" Because so many people were writing me to be like. It's great. Your blog's great. I love the places you talk about. Like, now can you tell me the secret places you're not writing about? Mm -hmm. And I was I shared a story about being on you know a train and on the way somewhere in Brooklyn and and we got stuck and everyone just started telling their life story and it was one of the more interesting you know traveling we were going from A to B stories you know more so than some places I've traveled to just because it, it's about the connection to other people and. If you truly stop and, and close your eyes and think about what's around you and then open them wanting to connect in a, an authentic way, that's far more important than the obsessive search for that place that no one else has found or that you're a more rugged traveler because you did X, Y, or Z. I just think that labeling it that way takes away from the grace that comes through when you put yourself out in the world and you kind of trust in this outcome. I'm going to I'm going to see what comes my way and interact with people in a way that I learn from, they learn from, and I learn something more about this world that we all live in. No, I, I think that's uh, a really great point. And I had a similar discussion with uh, Gary Arndt, who is a uh, travel blogger and photographer, and we talked about how some people have an obsession with going and, and seeing poverty and, uh, yeah. you know, that we're not trying to make a spectacle out of this, you know, out of people's misfortune, uh, if you can even, you know, if you can even call it that. And yeah, it's so important for people to be mindful when they, when they go to places that, uh, yeah, you got to learn, you got to have to learn about them because just trying to do it for your Instagram, just... <laughs> Yes, as you said, you're doing yourself a uh, a disservice. A disservice. And, the thing is, yeah. everyone craves personal transformation in some way. Like Gary, Gary's a friend. I've known him since the beginning of my travels. For them, I think we 2010 we met in Bangkok for the first time, and um, you know he's traveled. He 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 goes to UNESCO sites. Everyone has the thing that they're looking at. For me, it's been food, but you can't. It, it would be inauthentic to say oh, I don't care about personal transformation that accompanies travel. Because, of course, we all, in life in general, regardless, that that is an important discovery of ourselves. But it's when people have this expectation that travel has to deliver in a very specific way. You know, whether that, what you're describing with him as kind of going through to, to favelas or to um, poverty-stricken places and feeling this kind of white man's burden patting themselves on the back for doing so or just seeking out something that that is has to be excessive for it to be, feel authentic i think that's the problem anything even the mundane can be a beautiful transformative experience if you just stop to think about how you're interacting and and where you are and what you're learning whether it's at home or abroad and that attitude is way more important than where you go Absolutely. And and let's, uh, yeah, let's bring it back home, like your story in Brooklyn. I mean, I'm from New York, uh, New York State. My brother lives in Brooklyn. But when you're, and obviously Montreal is a very culturally diverse 
place and a very historical, a fascinating place to visit as well. But if you're in the middle of Indiana or Idaho or or Idaho, that's not it. Idaho. Sorry to any of these states that I'm just <laughs> randomly uh, picking on right now, but we get the emails uh, with under 30 experiences. Our, our travel company that say, "Hey, I'm stuck in Ohio. I want to get out. Uh, do you have any advice?" We literally got this email from a 10th grader uh, last Aww. last week, <laughs> and yeah, and so you know we've sent him some blog posts and try to help out the guy as much as we can. But but for just in general, it doesn't matter where you are, because uh, obviously you could listen to this podcast anywhere in the world. Do you mm-hmm. have any actionable uh, advice, Jody, for people who are trying to appreciate where they are, wherever they are on their path, and go through that personal transformation, maybe without spending thousands of dollars on a uh, around the world ticket? Yeah, I think you, I think that it's easy to conflate exoticism with something authentic, right? Um, there are people who romanticize these exotic experiences and get kind of pissed off when they see monks using cell phones in Thailand or using, you know, someone in Mongolia using a microwave. They're like personally affronted because they had built this sort of romantic idea of what these cultures are like and, and the world just doesn't work that way. So I think if you're in somewhere, wherever, I mean, history is history. I th- there's always a way to go back to the stories of the people that settled the place, the stories of how the area came to be. And that's always what I go back to, you know, why I love the history of Montreal is partly just because of how it's different from the rest of Canada in terms of how it was settled and, and when people came over, not just the present day language changes compared to the rest of Canada. Every place has things that make it interesting, even if it's a small place and, it, and somewhere you feel is mundane, going back to history and going to the library and looking up some character that you feel you know compelled to learn more about is, is a good place to start. Um, but I think traveling within your own backyard and then taking that to go meet with a local historian. For me, it was always food. So I seek out the Culinary Historian Society of wherever or someone who's a food historian because that's the lens I chose to give me history, culture, anthropology, everything, you know. That's... But choosing, choosing a lens that, that takes your place and making it makes it into something that connects you differently is really the first step to be to find that, you know. No, that, that definitely... Uh makes a lot of sense and uh, kind of speaking more about your personal brand uh, I, I love how you chose this very specific uh, lens and and Gary had said the same thing is that you know when he went to the uh, South Pacific he was going to all these islands that people just had never seen photos of before and they mm-hmm. were blown away and you know he won uh, like some big award from National Geographic. It might have been Photographer of the Year. and uh, But he took a very specific take and dug in, you know, he dug into something, something niche, but something that he could show, uh, he could differentiate himself from the other bloggers or uh, people with other brands. So could you tell me a little bit more? I mean, I know that also... Uh, you d- you don't eat gluten for medical reasons, of course, and so maybe that caught your attention, and that's why you started to become interested in uh, in the food specifically. But tell me more about how you chose that specific brand and what other people can learn from that. I, I think that the first important component to mention is that it has to be something you genuinely care about. I, I have people write me all the time. They're like, I really hate writing. So how can I be a better blogger? I was like, don't write, pick something else. Right. <laughs> I mean, you need to be connected to the way that you express these things as well. And there's obviously, you know, I was not a photographer at all. I've been honored to win awards for my photos, even though I was, the, I was terrible at it. You know, it, I had to personally decide to sit and learn and learn more and I still usually shoot in auto like I'm the first to say I'm not a, I'm not a technical photographer whatsoever um, but writing for me was always how the most important and, and photos were kind of you know the food on the plate but the plate itself um, needed to be there too and and in terms of 
my experience, your guess about celiac disease is accurate. I was diagnosed a long time ago um, before before gluten free was sexy, right. and um, and I had to pay attention to what I was doing. I I I didn't the first few years from 2008. You know, when I started traveling, I was just like, eh. I'll be fine. I, I didn't. I actually didn't. I wasn't very careful at first, and then I just kept getting sicker and sicker until I finally just had to become way more stringent. and And it's become a big part of my business. So for me, it was spices that became the gateway to that shift in my writing and in all my work around 2010, when I, you know, really had to be more careful about what I ate, which I should have been doing all along. I should be clear, um, but I was young and foolish. And I, I just, f- spices were this amazing ability to take something simple like an egg and make it into a thousand different things. And I grew up in a family that didn't really cook with many spices. Um, my mom's family is British and uh, not cooking. The, the stereotype of like amazing Indian food in Britain is true, but not in my family. And <laughs> it was very simple food that was good, but like no, <laughs> not flavorful in the way that I love to eat. And it was through this, through travel and through understanding how spices were used, getting fascinated by, you know, the Silk Road and, and just the idea of all of, of even Columbus setting sail in search of spices, really. Um, it changed so much about our world that it became something that I kind of obsessed over and genuinely took this little points wherever I went as how can I express the history of this place better through a meal that I ate and and then it turned into as well these amazing experiences of connecting with street food vendors and understanding more and more about a place through its food um, and and I'm very grateful for it because there are so many celiacs who truly are like I can never travel because I have this disease and I'm like no you can and then you have to be careful and there's places you can't go for sure where you just can't find safe food with any sort of enjoyment but for the most part, it's, it is accessible and it, it changes a burden into something really magical. That's, that's really interesting. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more uh, about the historical significance of the spice trade, if you don't mind uh, answering. And, and it does, you could probably say anything and I believe you. I, th- I mean, I'm not a... <laughs> Uh, I I know my history from high school for sure, but, uh, you know, I don't have a, a college degree in it, but I'm interested specifically because uh, recently I've been making a concerted effort to put more spices on my own food, uh, actually for health benefits. And so I've been diving into what type of uh, local herbs and spices they have here in Costa Rica where I live. And, uh, you know, they're so rich in antioxidants and polyphenols. And I, I recently uh, read how it's not only this spice, uh, you know, it's not only the flavor that was so significant in the spice trade, but also these these spices were so valuable because of the health yeah. benefits. And so I'm, I'm curious uh, if you could tell us a little bit more. Maybe, maybe I'm sure you know more than I do. <laughs> I mean, th- this could be like eight podcasts to talk about. So this is actually an amazing book called um, Spice, A History of Temptation, uh, written by Jack Turner, and it's um, it's really enjoyable to read. There are books specifically, like Nathaniel's Nutmeg, just about nutmeg. You know, the the Malabar Islands, the, the Malabar Coast, sorry, um, in India, where pepper, black pepper, originated from the, the spice islands of Indonesia, uh, Morocco, China. There's, there's just spices were all over, but as different groups took over different lands, access to those spices um, became difficult. You know, in Columbus, going out to try and find the new world was to try and find pepper, a way to get pepper, to get across. Um, And, of course, you know, naming what he did find, which was not pepper, um, pimientos, like the the chilies um, that he did find were not the black pepper he was looking for. But it wasn't just black pepper. It was everything, ginger, cinnamon, turmeric, everything. It wasn't simply that these um, places were... These spices were sought after um, because there are health benefits. It was there was like a, there's a religious link in terms of, you know, the Garden of Eden and all the spices in it. There's a lot of cultural obsession with spices, and it was like a real key to expanding world trade. Many of the valuable spices came, you know, from from those places: China, India, uh, the Moluccas, the Spice Islands, and in, in, in Indonesia. 
And Europeans dealt with those cultures, but they were looking for these new routes to get exclusive trade routes um, set up. And in the late 13th century, you know, Marco Polo explored Asia, established Venice as like the most important trade port of that time. And it was prosperous till like the end of the 1400s, pretty much. But at that time, you know, the Spanish and Portuguese found the cost of spices so high that they just started to search for their own routes. And that was the impetus for Vasco da Gama sailing around the, you know, the Cape of Good Hope to reach Calcutta um, and returning with, with amazing spices like ginger and cinnamon and pepper and, and ways that the Portuguese could continue trading uh, with India. And in 1492, you know, Columbus arrived to the New World, but he was looking f- not for us. He was looking for a direct route to the Spice Islands which he didn't find, but he did find allspice, vanilla, and red peppers and brought them back instead. So th- there's something called the Columbus Exchange that talks about you know, Columbus bringing certain things here, including terrible diseases, of course, um, and then the things that were brought back to the old world. Um, if you look at new and old world crops, it's really interesting. Um, things like cacao, chocolate, um, important where you are, um, and corn, and potatoes, tomatoes, capsicum peppers, pumpkins, all those things are, are new world crops, as well as uh, pineapple and, and papaya. So the kind of trade there was really, you know, very important to the way we all eat. But it was it was not uh, for any other reason that they wanted to get better access to spices and bring them back. Damn, that, that's really fascinating. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right, especially here with all the little uh, organic farms in in Costa Rica with the cacao and uh, cinnamon and anti-inflammatories like uh, uh, turmeric, 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 however you say it in English, uh, curcuma in in Spanish for the curcumins uh, that are just so, yeah, so good for you. And um, yeah, there's a a little place uh, near where where I live called La Botanica and... uh, yeah, they have so many different herbal remedies that you've never heard of. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's or or maybe you have because you're so you're far more educated yeah. than the the normal person on this type of thing. <laughs> but uh, even you mentioned potatoes, and and we bring uh, our travelers when we are in the Sacred Valley of Peru to a uh, place where the indigenous people are are still farming potatoes in a cooperative uh, manner amongst themselves and they have a th- at least a thousand different types of potatoes there yeah. it's uh, I mean they're from the Andes originally right it's, sure people think that Europe Europe was where potatoes come from and they they weren't not only were they not from Europe but Europeans they were considered a poor person's food and people just didn't want to eat them they wanted bread because that's what the nobility ate and they had to like essentially trick people into cooking with potatoes at first because people didn't want to do it. And there's like, there's another like single, I, w- I went through like a kick of single purpose history books that I read. So I read a book about potatoes only. Whoa. Um, and like Parmentier in France was the one to like bring potatoes to the masses and sort of make them something interesting enough so that they were a food that could be eaten because people were starving at the time. Um, there, there are, I think all of these, like you said, it was so expensive that, you know, nutmeg at the, in the, 1300s because of all the tariffs and everything imposed but also the value of nutmeg it was more valuable than gold i mean people paid rent and taxes in black pepper it each of these spices and that's the crazy thing like you know we go to the the supermarket down the street in not just here like in most places now you can buy spices so cheaply and to think of how people you know went to war over them in the past it's just a crazy it's a crazy way to view history and it's part of what really drew me in Sure, and that goes back to that very specific lens. Like you said, it's a crazy way to view history. And uh, yeah, what you're talking about right now is very interesting. So that's why people read your stuff. <laughs> so that's perfect. Yeah, per- point point proven. Uh, but Jody, you also talk about wellness, which is a big topic on our on our podcast. You mentioned that you were uh, glu- you were gluten free before it was cool, just like uh, people <laughs> in the Andes eating potato or no, sorry, eating quinoa before right. gluten free was cool. And uh, yeah, all of all of that. Um, 
but could you tell me a little bit more? Uh, I know you you wrote uh, one of the top articles on your site was about your 10 day Vipassana retreat. Um, I'd be fascinated to to hear a little bit more about your experience uh, as with silence and spiders, as you say. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty interesting few days of my life. Um, yeah, you know, I think as with everything, the site started as a way to share what was going on in my life with my family. And then I was like, who are these random people leaving comments who are not my mother? <laughs> um, it took, it wasn't until 2010. I never traveled with a laptop or even a, like I had my old Blackberry with me until 2010 was when I moved over to WordPress and actually realized I may be not going to be a lawyer again. I, I always just kind of wrote about what I found fascinating because if the hope was if I found it fascinating enough, then could write about it interestingly enough maybe people would not you know hate me for it um i got told at the beginning very often you know your pieces are too long you're not looking to bring in people just like you you're looking to bring in anyone and i was like adamant no i i, I didn't quit my job to build a business around a specific set of rules that were applicable at the time I, if i wanted to write 5000 words about the history of chili peppers i would and i did and i've and the readers i've met over the years are awesome. Like I, I have to say, I've done food tours for them in, in several countries now. Um, and I would meet them and we'd get into these great discussions about history and anthropology. And I was like, these are people I would be friends with if I met them at a party. And that made me feel like I was being true to myself, you know, in the way that I wrote. So similarly, when I started writing more about the wellness component of life, um, as someone, you know, in my mid to late thirties at the time, I was like, I'm really interested in other people's experiences and it, it's a huge part of who we all are as people um so i you know i wasn't sure how it'd be received from my readers but it was received very very well and people seem to enjoy that kind of flip side to the travel experience how you deal with insomnia anxiety how you deal with mindfulness when your life is different and even when it's not right these these lessons apply at all times so the Vipassana was something I'd never meditated before. And I was like, yeah, I'll do a 10-day silent meditation. That sounds great. No um, big deal. <laughs> no big deal. My friends were like, you're crazy. You're going to die. Um, and they're like, I've never heard you not talk, for, let alone <laughs> for 10 days. And actually, as I said in the piece, the not talking part was the easy part. For me, the hardest part was the pain, physical pain, uh, because I'd been dealing with chronic pain um, for the last few years, and I wasn't wasn't able to get a handle on it and so the physical pain uh, moment to moment was excruciating and and then the spider component was you know I was arachnophobe and they were like these daddy long legs falling from the ceiling in the middle of the meditation room oh my god uh, and it was a, it was a real challenge on on many levels but i think an extraordinarily important thing for me personally in terms of how i lead my life today i've kept up a meditation practice not necessarily vipassana you know i've tried different types and it varies depending on what I feel like I need at the time, but I think it's for, for one aspect, it's impossible to be bored. I, I, I wasn't someone who got easily bored, but I, I did, we all do on long bus rides or whatever. And I think since that 10 day experience, it's just, it's just not possible. And as you know, these days I'm, I've kind of been confined. I've been on bed rest pretty much for six months with a pretty insane combination of medical issues that are going on and people always ask are you bored and I'm like no I'm really I'm really not I think I've lost the capacity to be bored I'm reading I'm you know I'm listening to podcasts and stuff along the way but I'm even when I'm not I think there's just something that's settled within me that created this space where boredom was never possible interesting interesting could, could you tell me a little bit more about that now if you're sitting uh with literally, okay, you're waiting for a bus, for example, and let's say your phone's dead because we know everybody in the modern day and age is going to be on their phone. And yeah, I can get it. I, I get that. Actually, I heard the uh, one of the co-founders of Twitter say one time, oh, it would be impossible to be bored because now we have Twitter. But say you didn't and you were just sitting there. Are you saying that you just feel so much more... Uh, at peace and you don't have the nervous energy where you can just sit and enjoy your surroundings? Is is that what you mean there? 
I think that there's less of that inner restlessness that I think a lot of us have, especially if our brain circuits are used to the immediacy of technology. Um, but also I just go into like a body scan meditation <laughs> myself, just standing there like oh, I have time. Great. And I'll just, you know, start with the head and go down. And, and I think that does the, the benefit. It has the benefit of calming you down anyhow, even if you weren't calm or, or sort of um, separating you from that restlessness. But it's also, it just never gets old. I guess every time it, 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 I, I do feel myself kind of feeling anxious about this, this empty space of time, uh, I just start doing a meditation uh, that I learned in the Vipassana or another, a different type. Or, um, But uh, yeah, it doesn't really affect me in the same way. It, it's like it, it allows me to keep perspective that isn't really losing perspective. It's not like I was at my at the bus stop losing my shit, you know? Um, it's more that it it's just a sense of of non restless weight that I probably couldn't have mustered in the past. That that's really cool. Uh, and and I, I have a very similar practice where wherever I am, you know, oh, okay, I have to wait in line at a restaurant uh, to pay for my food. Well, at that point, I can take that time for myself to take a couple breaths. And yes, oh, I feel some tension in my shoulders. Uh, oh, how's my posture? Well, let me, let me adjust my posture for a second. Let me release my shoulders and try to uh, let that tension go a little bit and check in with myself. Or I, I know probably four years ago or so, I was riding on a lot of buses across Central America. Yeah, maybe five, five, six years ago at this point. And uh, it was at the very beginning of my meditation practice. And I said, wow, okay, well, uh, I can, I am capable of sitting for 12 hours on a bus ride across Honduras, which seems really, really long to be, you know, I took buses all across Central America, but I was able to, to sit there. So if somebody's listening to, to this and they want to be a little bit more at peace or they're not familiar with the concept that you can meditate at any time, you know, I don't sit there, I don't sit cross-legged when I'm uh, in line waiting to order a burrito, uh, right? But it's still yeah, a form of meditation. Way to disrupt everything, right? It's like, I do see people do that sometimes. And I'm like, that's really not the point. You being right. the center of attention is not the point. Um, I think it's, you know, if there's a book people want to start with, there's a lot of great books on, on meditation out there and some, you know, 10% happier. There's, there's some interesting ones about the, the people's personal stories, but I think the book that I recommend the most is um, Full Catastrophe Living, which is John Kabat-Zinn, who's sort of the, the, the granddaddy of uh, Western mindfulness. These And the book itself, you know, talks about the stresses of modern day life and, and how mindfulness and meditation can go hand in hand with it. But it's just such an overall instructive book um, that I think it's a great start for anyone. It's it's like quite a long book, but I, I always tell people to start there. Okay, great. And if people can't sit through a long book, because the same people who have trouble doing a, a five minute meditation are going to be this probably the same <laughs> ones who can't read the five hundred page full catastrophe living or however long it is. Do you have a uh, not to say a hack, but a, a, a shorter book. Yeah, or a shorter book or a shorter practice, just that people. To be can honest, start like I enjoy. was someone who couldn't sit through five minutes of meditation, but I read that book. I think for me, reading was always easier than meditating. Okay. Um, I mean, you can start with. There's a great free app called Insight Timer, and I know you know people people also use Headspace a lot, and that's transcendental meditation specifically. But that's a specific kind, so I I think Insight Timer is a better start because. They have thousands of guided meditations as well as just beautiful kind of like singing bowl music, but um, lectures as well on mindfulness um, from from great writers and, and thinkers uh, like Tao Brack. And um, that is a good way to start if they've got their phone and they're at the bus stop and they're feeling restless, put on, you know, a short guided meditation instead of trying to muster it all from the inside. Beautiful, beautiful. And to be clear, for people, you don't even have to close your eyes. It doesn't, That's right. It doesn't mean... It's all inside, friends. It's all inside. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Jody, you have, you have uh, listed off a 
wealth of resources here and I want to make sure everybody knows they can go to under30experiences.com slash blog or in the show notes uh, for uh, on iTunes but we'll try to link up all of this stuff including uh, Jody's blog posts that she has mentioned uh, especially what does off the beaten path really mean I'd like to read that and then the book uh, the books on spices, 10% happier, full catastrophe living, uh, the link to the app for the insight timer, and also episode 39 of the Live Different podcast with Gary Arndt. So I'm taking some notes here and we'll be sure to, to link all that stuff up. Um, so Jody, all right. So you, uh, could you tell me a little bit more, um, about where you currently are, and I know that you have, uh, yeah, you have some health things going on. I mean, geez, bed rest for six months. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to, to me. Uh, but yeah, could you tell me a little bit more about how, just to frame it for people, uh, how you mentioned when we were talking, when we weren't recording, that you know, you feel quite grateful that you've been able to build this business that's running itself and that you can take the time to figure out what's going on uh, with yourself. And and I think that's that's such valuable information for other people to to learn. So, yeah, could you bring us up to speed a little bit? Sure. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, the current situation I'm in is, is like a black swan kind of problem. <laughs> there really is... Um, I, I ended up having to get a spinal tap at a hospital in New York City. The needles they used were a lot bigger than they should have used for my size. Um, and I ended up with a cerebrospinal leak, which is this incredibly beyond debilitating condition where you have a leak of spinal fluid, which itself is toxic outside the dura, which is the membrane that it's held within. But when you're leaking and you, you can't stand up because when you stand up, your brain is basically sucked down into your spinal cord because of the low pressure, the, the lack of fluid that usually kind of buoys it up in your brain. So for terrible leaks, if you try and be upright too long, you know, you end up with brain damage, traumatic brain injury. Um, it really messes with your nervous system because the spinal fluid shouldn't be out of um, where it is, but also it affects all the nerves. And it's just been a crazy process because most doctors haven't heard of it and the procedures to fix it are pretty um, Victorian. Someone said <laughs> Victorian, and I think that's accurate. You basically inject into your epidural space your own blood and sometimes fibrin glue. So it took me months to get to Duke Hospital uh, in North Carolina. That's where they treated me. I did four rounds of patching, and the last one uh, I went into anaphylaxis, so we can't do them again. <laughs> because I almost died on the table. Oh, jeez. Um, so now I'm, re I'm, you know, trying to recover from this and see where we go next. Um, it is terrible to hear people's stories. In a sense, I'm very lucky that I built this business and was able to sort of have a network where people heard what was happening and then reached out. Some of my readers are anesthesiologists, doctors. You know, having that connection was fantastic because I got to the best hospital for patching that I could and they use techniques that other hospitals don't know how to do, and that's that's probably you know extremely fortunate. But also, um, people go 13 years sometimes not being diagnosed, being told they just have migraines, even though when they lie down, their headache goes away, um, and it's terrible for the body to be leaking that long. So, I basically have had you know a roller coaster of very very bleak times. At at a minimum, the life I built is going to not be possible. There's no way I can. Um, go back to it even if I am sealed up because I can't bend, lift, or twist for a year, but even still lifting anything heavy like suitcases, you know, moving your body in certain ways that come naturally when you're traveling risks blowing a new leak again because the tissue is quite, you know, fragile in the areas that are patched. So from a from a mental perspective, it's been an incredible, difficult challenge to 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 just face that, right? And the grief of what I built. But on the on the flip side um, whatever I do with the site and whatnot has been buoyed by the readers I've got and the community I've got. And the fact that, you know, we talk about passive income when we talk about building our business, sometimes it's, it's, it can be a myth in that, you know, it's, it's this unicorn people chase after, but there are ways to set things up. And for me, I sell celiac translation cards, for example, that I, I build in detail. They're double translated for celiacs who love food, but who are scared to travel. 
there was nothing out them on the market like that. Um, and that's why I built them because I needed them. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, maybe other people do. Those, those are still selling. My store is up there. I sell food food maps I drew, hand drew. These are you know products I built that are different. But having set up that process already, it takes some upkeep. And I have blogger friends who have graciously um, given me some of their time to help with things that crop up. But for the most part, the time I have to lie down for this amount of time and just give my body a chance to see if it can heal from this and the time I have to not worry about work in full because these these businesses are still going is, is a really incredible thing. And, and if I was still a lawyer, I would be in a lot more trouble in terms of not being able to take six months off, obviously, um, but also just not mentally being familiar with the kind of flexibility that comes with being an entrepreneur, especially one who you know, has had a ton of uncertainty having to travel for so long. This is a, a very different kind of uncertainty, but I think I, I'm probably in a uniquely better place because of the life I lived, um, although it means that the grief is also a lot harder to deal with right now. Sure, sure. I, I understand it. Well, as best, as, as empathetic as I can be in a, in a situation like this. So uh, thank you for for sharing that, Jody, and uh, we do have a lot of travelers through under 30 experiences uh, who are gluten-free or to, who do have celiac disease, and we will definitely uh, share your resources with them because all the time we have travelers who come with the handwritten notes from Google Translate, and right. uh, yeah, it's important that they that they get that information information correct and uh yeah i'm i'm not exactly sure familiar with your your product but indonesian for example or balinese are these languages that these th this is what these gluten uh these celiac cards are like w so can we translate uh, them so far so each country is completely different so it's not like i can take an english one and and use it and, and that's kind of what makes them special is that um I found when I was traveling countries like Indonesia, for example, where celiac disease isn't that well known, um, just saying, you know, I can't eat gluten, it's in soy sauce, it's in this, this, it's in wheat, barley, and rye. No one knows what has that in their products. Nobody, nobody knows. Um, and so what I needed to do was write a card that used all the local food names in the local languages. And, and I do have free guides that go with them. Um, that, that say all the foods that are usually safe and not safe because when you go to a, my goal wasn't here's only a list of restaurants that are safe for you. It was how can you eat locally knowing the, like having the armed knowledge of the actual dishes in, in the local language that are, are going to be usually without wheat and then you can ask to specify. So Bahasa Indonesia, Bahasa Malaysia are in the works. Unfortunately, this, um, this crisis of mine has put a hold on a lot of them. Um, so far, I've got, I believe, 11 countries, and I have a, a huge table of translators, people who've signed up to be paid to help me translate. So um, there will be a lot more countries eventually is my hope, and that's the one thing I do want to get back to soon because it is so useful for travelers. Um, I do have... Um, I have two translators in Balinese as well, so I plan to do both Bahasa and Balinese. Great. Well, uh, I will I will check those out and certainly share them with our community as a, as a resource. Uh, Jody, if I, I want to let you go here in in a couple minutes, um, but I wanted to to wrap up and and really just ask you if you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? I think I would have started on WordPress. <laughs> Starting okay. a blogger was a mistake. Um, I, I think from a business perspective, I didn't plan for it to be a business, right? There was this, this kind of amazing, unexpected serendipity of a readership I didn't ever need or want, you know? I thought I would go for a year, come back, uh, and be a lawyer again. And so from, from a business perspective, there are things I really wished I had done. Started on WordPress um, learned more about photography, those kinds of things. But, you know, it, given that it wasn't my plan, it's understandable that I wasn't focused on it. I think um, there's, there's a, I think Brene Brown did a podcast with um, Krista Tippett from On Being recently. And, I, and her, she, she had this amazing quote, like, your, your level of true belonging can never be bigger than your willingness to be brave and stand by yourself and stand for something by yourself. And I think 
of everything I've done and, and the ways that it's come about, um, I, I never compromised on what I really was passionate about and believed in, even if people thought I was nuts. And in that sense, while there are things I would change um, on, a, on a day-to-day level sometimes, I, I think the overall aspect of it wouldn't. And, and I got to tell you, when I was on that table and, and going into anaphylaxis, the doctor was like, you're really calm. Like, why are you so calm? Were you in shock? And I was like, no, I wasn't. I was like, they're going to try and keep me alive. And if not, I was thinking back to the business I built, to the life I led. And I'm like, you know, I, I did everything that I wanted and I was really proud of it. And that was like, that's an amazing gift too. Like how many people get to say that? Well, Jody, that is an amazing place to wrap up. I would say if anybody wants to, uh, learn more about your work. Uh, I know they can uh, check out LegalNomads.com. Is there anywhere else where they can connect with you personally? Uh, sure. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Legal Nomads as well. And the fan page is Legal Nomads on Facebook. Um, and those are the, th- the main places that I tend to be. Uh, I'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll link to the gluten-free cards and, and my maps, the, the, the food maps. So that's all in one big area of the site absolutely we will definitely do that jody thanks for being such an amazing spirit and sharing your story thank you it's a pleasure to be here hey are you looking for an adventure are you looking to take your life to the next level to reflect to retreat to figure out what the next steps for you are if so i would love for you to come to bali indonesia with me and my girlfriend and yoga teacher, Luz Garcia. We are staying in the Malayang village in an amazing villa, and we want a dozen people to come with us this September 30th for this yoga and mindfulness retreat to combine it with some incredible adventure on this sacred island, the island of gods, as they call it. Uh, We're going to have cultural experiences that we have set up over the last five years operating on the island of Bali uh, through under 30 experiences, going into the homes and temples of the local people. We're going to have a uh, children's orchestra lesson. Uh, We have really nice little causes that we support in this village in Bali. It's going to be an incredible experience. If you want more information, you can email me directly, maddenunder30experiences.com, and no, you do not have to be under 30. We are an inclusive group rather than an exclusive group, and if you are a podcast listener, that would be amazing to have you out there. We're going to throw out $100 off right now using the code LIVEDIFFERENT, and I would love to take our relationship to the next level and have you be part of our community. Check it out, under30experiences.com.